Welcome to the five. The same five questions, a completely different experience every time. I met today's guest a very long time ago. Uh, we have known each other most of our lives. She is a Tennessee girl who moved away to the great north, but you can never take the Tennessee out of the girl. So how about you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, my name's Ashley Abafeld. I born and raised in Kingston, Tennessee. I, I can't tell you how long we've known each other. Like, I don't have a memory of not knowing who you were. So probably elementary school at some point. Um, but I moved to Wisconsin. I live in Appleton, which is near Green Bay, the Packer country. Um, NFL is really big here, except for this year, which has not been good. <laughs> but um, I've lived up here now since 2002. So I've lived up here 21 years. I still get asked where my accent's from to this day. Um, and it does get thicker when I come back to visit my parents. <laughs> so... How about when you drink? Oh, yeah, yeah. It does definitely get thicker when I drink. Definitely. I'm going to ask you five questions. You can answer them. Take as much time as you want and everything. You ready? I'm ready. All right. What's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to you? So when I was thinking about this, there's a lot of off-the-wall weird things that have happened to me from things like I was bit by a monkey. Um... I had, me and my husband have some kind of weird psychic connection where we will be thinking the same thing and it's not, it's like completely random things. But when I really think about everything, I'm pretty sure the weirdest thing that ever happened to me was I had a girl try to take over my life. <laughs> Back in, I was like 19 years old. I was going to go to the University of Tennessee for, I think, I think it was like sophomore, junior year or something. And it was just at the height when AOL and chat rooms and all of that stuff was getting really big. And we had just gotten a computer. And so I'm in a chat room with other people that are going to UT that year. And I meet this girl in there. Her name's Annie. And... I'm talking with her and we're going to be in the same dorm. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I've already made a friend and I have not even started school yet. So we hang out. I meet her. I, I think she's really cool. We start hanging out more. And she's actually like, I met a guy online that I actually think you get along with better than I get along with. I'm like, oh, okay. So we, he, she introduces me to him. I am now married to him. So there is good to the story. <laughs> But she introduces me to him, and then we start hanging out, whatever. Then she starts, like, sort of hitting on him after she's introduced me to him. And then she's like, we're hanging out. I still think everything's cool. And then I start bringing her to Kingston to football games. Because, you know, when, you, when you're just out of high school, you still go to games and stuff. You still know people. And so I would bring her with me. We'd go, she'd come to football games, whatever. Then she started, like, calling my friends when I wasn't there. Um, she, would co she, she would go visit my family without me. Um, I'll never forget, there was, there's a, a family we're really close to, so um the parents are really good friends and so their kids and my sisters and I are really we're really close we went on vacations together kind of thing and she like called and went to dinner with them and was like doing all this stuff with them and then she started bad mouthing me to all my family and friends and I was like what is happening like what is happening I felt like I was in single white female and she was trying, like literally trying to push me out of my own life. And so I just had to like, we ended up cutting her off, you know, just completely distancing ourselves. Um, and then one day, I don't, my husband, now husband and I were living together and she called and, and just randomly called and asked how we're doing. 
And it's like, don't call here again. She's like, could I have one more chance at taking your life over? Oh, yeah. I guess it's cool that my life was just so good that <laughs> she wanted to take it over. But it was very bizarre. That is very strange. I, I didn't realize it was that good. Like, I, re I, looking back, I'm like, I guess it was a really cool life I had. I guess it does, in a way, kind of make you appreciate it. If it's good enough that somebody wants to steal it. It's a good way to look at it. I'm going to think about it like that from now on. Okay. You ready for the next one? Yes. What's the scariest thing that's ever happened to you? This is the question I struggled with the most. I am a complete wimp. I don't do horror movies. I don't like scary stories. When I watched Silence of the Lambs when I was like 12, I saw it once and I can still remember every single scene. And it's what, 32 years later? Like I'm completely a wimp when it comes to scary stuff. So I was struggling with this because I'm like, some of my scariest moments are actually nightmares I've had, which aren't real. So it's not necessarily a route of something that physically scared scared me. It's more of the unknown. Um, so the scariest situation that's ever happened to me was when I decided to move from Tennessee to Wisconsin. Um, we had there was a lot going on at the time. My husband had had a tumor in his head. And he had to have surgery, and there was some complications, and it kept not getting better. And because his family lived here, he had done the surgery here. So we decided maybe we needed to get closer to the surgeon who did the, who did the surgery so that he could figure this out. And we were both kind of in dead-end jobs. He had to drop out of school because of the stuff with his head. I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. So <laughs> we decided, let's move. Let's just start over which was really interesting about six months before it happened. It was really exciting. Um, but we got married and we moved less than a month after getting married. So by the time it actually came to doing it, it was very scary. Um, we ended up, we lived with his parents for a little while when we first got up here. I had a job, but it hadn't started yet when we moved. There was still like two months before it started when we moved up here. I didn't know, I didn't know anybody, nobody outside of the two in-laws and my husband. I didn't know anybody. So I had no idea. I had no idea if I was going to make friends. I had no idea where anything was. How do I get to the grocery store? How do I get to Walmart? You know, I didn't know where, I. I it felt very, it felt very scary and I, I spent a lot of time friends was still on the air at the time I spent a lot of time watching friends and talking to my mom about like oh, the latest episode or um, that was my connection back was let's talk about the tv shows um but it was it was also very hard um the first few months were a, a very it was scary and it was it was very depressing at the same time because I felt very alone in my fear because you don't want to admit to, the, to your friends and your family back home how much you're struggling because, you know, they're going to say, oh, well, you made this choice. Or <laughs> so you're worried that that's what they're going to say is that you made this choice. And it was it was just a it was a really, really hard time. Um, and I was really. I was I, I was scared. You're going into a complete unknown situation, and I know you grew up in a small town where you know about everybody, and uh, I know down in the south also there's there's usually a lot of you're connected with a lot of family and everything, and so to ju to to move that far away from all those connections, I think that would be one of the scariest things I could really think of. You know, just that unknown and just kind of starting over on everything that you've done. So I'm really proud of you. Like, that's a really brave thing you've done. Well, thanks. I don't know if you know this, but there's not like um, an easy way to make friends as an adult. You know, in high school, you get these 
you get these groups that you can join. Like I was in band or some people played football or whatever. There's automatic groups, clubs, whatever that you can join and you can be friends with people because you've got like interests. It's not as easy as an adult to just find that that niche. And so it took a long time for me to have people that I would consider, you know, not just workplace proximity acquaintances. You know, there were actual people that I hung out with outside of the work environment. So it, there was a there was a year that it felt very lonely, very isolated, which added to the the scariness of the situation because it was taking so long for that to change for for me to feel like well now I know where Walmart is so at least I can get there I know where the grocery store is but you still don't have that day to day interaction with a friend or um see you know talk I couldn't drive to my parents for dinner you know but technology has increased a lot I actually have sometimes um I have FaceTime dinner with my parents or um, we talk every Sunday night. That's our our routine. And so now I'm glad I went through it because I feel like overall I'm a lot more independent than I thought I was. Um, I thought I was, I always thought I was the independent one in my family growing up. And I, I, I was, if you compare me to my sisters, even when I was living there, I was much more independent. <laughs> I was my, I'm much more independent now than I than I was at the time, and I got the I I like living here. I mean, there's a lot of snow. It snowed today, but it, it is a beautiful area. There's so many parks. There's so many things to do, and it's a, it is a very nice area. So in the end, again, it all worked out, but it was a very scary time and a very scary decision you know going back real quick to that uh, it's really hard for adults to make friends you know i i do a adult dodgeball league and uh, i met a lot of really cool people at it but what really really surprised me like you know we played adult dodgeball we it's like a wednesday night thing and we would go and we'd play and we finally went out together as like a group to do something like somebody had like a, a get together and everything and I still remember like these people because it's kind of like you're you've played ball with them, you talk to people and everything, but like you know we come together and I remember like it's it's kind of like you go back to school a little bit when you meet new people and everything, and you're like, am I cool enough to hang with these people, you know? And I still remember like there's a one girl, her name is Rachel, and she's like. She would be the cool girl, you know, out of the group. And, you know, she come up and she was like talking and we just kind of had a, like a real conversation. And she was like, are we like friends now? And I was like, yeah, we're like friends now. And she was like, thank God, because it is so hard to make friends She's like, I, I really don't have a lot of friends. And, you know, it's like you look at her and you're like, she's like a beautiful young woman. You think she's like probably got people knocking down the door. And she's and then the majority of people's like, I have struggled to make friends and make connections. And so I just want to bring that up because I know there's a lot of people out there that are lonely like, I know it just from, like, social media and stuff. There's people, there's a lot of lonely people that just want to have somebody to talk to. You're not alone. Everybody out there is looking for somebody. So when you feel like you're alone and everything, just keep looking. You'll find people out there. And it, that's a hard thing to do. For people for people who might be watching this, I have found people. I mean, it took a long, it took a long time. But now I have a group of friends that, like I could, we may not hang out all the time because they have kids or they have this going on or that going on. And, but I could text any one of them right now and they would respond, you know, so it, it is possible, but it, it does take, 
you have to put in effort too. You can't, you can't, it's not like high school or middle school or college where it's easy to meet people. You have to actually cultivate it. And sometimes you got to step out of that comfort zone and go out where the people's at. <laughs> and that's hard to do. Yes. And even harder now after the pandemic. I was actually t- uh, messaging with a friend of mine um, who we have a very funny relationship. We, Him and I pretend to hate each other. And we really don't, but we pretend. Um, he messaged me and he's like, so are we going to do more get togethers now that everything's sort of normalized because I think it's hurting people's mental health. And um, my house is really good for get get togethers. We have a big backyard and, and we have, we like to grill and do that kind of stuff. So I'm like, yes, it's going to happen this year. We're going to do more things like that. So I think now more than ever, a lot of people are more thirsty for it. And I think, I also think we've all gotten used to being isolated. I know I have. I've gotten used to working at home and not not seeing people every day and and it's almost become normal for me to either turn down plans or not make plans. So even I'm trying now to like push myself a little bit more to do things or go to somebody's house or go out to dinner um because it's everything feels a little bit weirder after the pandemic, I guess. All right. You ready for the next one? I am. What's the most memorable moment of your life so far? This was another one I took a long time to think. I really thought about this a long time. Um, and I based it on not only was the experience memorable, but it was a pivoting moment in my adult life. My Everything that I knew changed. Um, so I had the same job for 11 years, the job that I got here when I started in 2022 and moved up within the company. I'd gone from just being, um, like a business to business sales inside salesperson on the phone, all the way up to an operations manager over a program of 150 people and 14 team leaders. So I had a lot of, I had gone from, you know, just an individual contributor to having a ton of responsibility. I was very well respected within the teams. Um, I had been leader of the year one year. Like there was just, I have, I got, went on business trips and all of these things. And so August 19th, 2013, I remember the date. Um, I get pulled into a conference room with our HR guy and my boss, and I'm told that I'm part of a reduction in force and that I, I've lost my job. My job was my identity at that time. Like, it it was my everything. Um, All of my friends, all of my friends were people that I worked with. Aside from, I will say, aside from one person that I met through somebody I worked with, all of my friends were people that I worked with. And I didn't I didn't get to say goodbye to anybody. I didn't get to I had to come back that evening with the HR guy watching me take my stuff that has been in the you know, been in my office for four years. There's stuff that I just was I was so zombied that I, I there's stuff I don't have. And it's not a big deal now. I mean but there's things that I, I didn't even think to grab because my mind wasn't there. And it was it was very traumatic. It was a very traumatic moment. Um I remember I remember not being able to drive home right away because I was crying and in shock. Um, I called one of my friends who used to work with, used to work there with me and he had since, he had since moved on to a different job. The same guy that pretends not to like me. Um, I called him. He like took his lunch break and drove to my house because I just couldn't even, I could barely process what was going on. And then 
And then you have to navigate, oh my goodness, I have to find an, I have to find a job. I have to file for unemployment, like all of these things um, just happen. And, but the bigger impact is I had no idea why. Why was I the one chosen? And that really messed with me. That really messed with me because, I mean, I'm not the most, secure person. All of us have insecurities. And for a long time, I was able to mask a lot of my insecurities with my with being fun or being the, the bubbly, loud, funny person. Um, and people just liked me. And this just like flipped everything that I knew. And I, I started, all the insecurities came up because like, well, what? I can't do anything right now. And I don't know if this is ever going to happen again because I don't know what I did wrong to be the one selected. However, hindsight's always going to be helpful in this type of situation. Looking back, I was not in a good place in, in things. I, I actually think that if, I had continued in that job, I'd be divorced right now. I was headed down a a toxic path. I was drinking too much. I was going out with people from work on on school nights and coming into work hungover. I was not happy. I thought I was happy but I really wasn't happy. And I think that this happened to get me out of that situation because I wouldn't, I wouldn't have pulled myself out of it. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have left on my own. In fact, I turned down a job like three months before I got laid off. Um, I still haven't made peace with why I was fired Every time my, my boss messages me now, I'm like, oh, gosh, what did I do? There's still that element of what, what happened. And it's never, it's never anything. I get, you know, I do well on my reviews and all of those things. But there's always that, that little tiny voice back here going, are you sure? Are you sure you didn't do anything? You know, were you late on this? Did this happen? Um, so it's it's also memorable because some of those feelings stuck with me, too. Um, and it was, I know it's not a good moment. It's not a good moment. And it's not a good memory. But it was a extremely pivotal point in my adult life. And now, nine and a half years later, I'm in a much better spot emotionally, mentally, financially, um, in my relationships. You know, now I have friends that aren't friends with me because I go out and drink with them. They're friends with me because they like being around me and we would be there for, we, we're there for each other. Not, oh, I'm going to suck up to the boss and go out with her so that she's nice to me. You know, it, it made me, it changed my perspective on so many things. And I appreciate different people. I appreciate situations differently. Now, um, I was, I was just not, I wasn't in a good place. I was becoming a toxic person. You know, I always say we never know if something's good or bad for us until we're farther down on the timeline. Because sometimes you can think something amazing, the most wonderful thing has happened to you, and it leads you to a really bad place. And then something like this, where you think it's the worst thing that possibly could happen to you, and it actually leads you to a better place. And that's why I'm always like, hey, I know right now it sucks, but you never know where it's going to lead you, you know, so you can't give up. You can't, you got to keep 
on that path going down because you never know when this was actually a good thing, you know. It's still traumatic. I have I ha I still have some social anxiety because of it. Because after it happened I kind of closed myself off because I just I I couldn't I wasn't processing what happened. And so I didn't want to talk to anybody that still worked there. Even if we had been friends, it was very hard for me to even converse with anybody who still worked there. So I didn't talk to, for months, I didn't talk to people that still worked there. And to this day, there's still only a handful that I, that I have any sort of contact with, but it was really isol it was isolating to come up quite a bit. But it was really like, maybe question everything. And I started to develop a social anxiety because of that. Because I'm like, well, it, if I lose a job that I'm really good at, does anyone, is anything real? <laughs> does anybody even like me? And, and I just didn't want to be around anybody. So it took a long time. It wasn't until probably a year later um i had been in a different job for about six months at that point and i actually felt like okay i'm gonna be okay you know it took a long time to feel that way and now i wouldn't change it i actually probably you know going back i probably would have quit earlier before some of the toxic things I did happen before some of the poor decisions I made in my that spilled over into my personal life. I probably would have quit sooner. Well, I'm happy for you. <laughs> I'm happy now. It was just a very defining moment. It's one of those things that it changed the trajectory of everything that I was doing in my life. And it it couldn't be different. You know, there's some moments that like, it could go either way and it wasn't really going to change where you are at this moment. That was, I'm here in this moment because of that situation. And you're right. There's a lot of times, especially as an adult, you actually, you are your job. You know, you, you feel represented by your job. That's, that becomes like a very defining part of your self-worth like who you are and something that can be stripped away that easily basically takes like your feet out from under you. You're like, if some, you can strip a part of me away, like my personality, who I am is this wrapped up in this and you can take it away just like that. And not only that, then you have the unknown of not having a job. It's absolutely a scary thing. And a lot of people, unfortunately, in the past couple of years have had to go through it. What Gabe said that resonated with me was that loss of identity, that it was all, it was all my job. Every, all of my self-worth was in that role. Um, so I also don't do that anymore. Like, I'm, I'm dedicated to my job. I like my job and I like the people I work with, but it's no longer how I judge who I am as a person. I, I did the best I could to disconnect it, you know, and I've been in my, I've been in my job over six years now and I still have been able to maintain that. Okay. How, how I am as a person is not this job. So I think that, again trying to take lessons away from some of these experiences that we have is is critical for personal growth and i wouldn't be here talking to you about these things if that hadn't happened are you ready for the hard one yeah what's the saddest thing that's ever happened to you well I, and i thought again this is another one we've all had sad experiences and I feel kind of bad because I feel like everything I've talked about so far has been sort of not positive experiences in my life. Um, I think the saddest I ever felt was when 
my uh, my dog Dolby passed away. Um, I never had pets growing up. We di- we didn't have both my parents. Both parents worked. We were busy. We were not. We weren't the most responsible kids. Um, my mom also had a bad experience with a dog when she was a child, so she didn't want. She didn't really want a pet. Um, so we just we never had pets growing up. My first real pet was as an adult. And we got this wonderful, stubborn, pain-in-the-butt beagle. We got him when he was six months old. We adopted him. And he was a handful. We've had, I've had a total of five dogs now. And he was the most stubborn, obstinate, didn't listen, wonderful, fun, dog that we've had and he he was pretty sick in the end of his life he had Cushing's disease he had an enlarged heart he had spots in his lungs it, it, nothing was going his way I mean it just he was not meant for a long life he packed a lot of personality and life into a shorter period of time and we were actually visiting my parents um, back in 2019. We were visiting my parents, and he collapsed. So we rushed him to the local vet and had to make the, the horrible decision. And I think what compounded is it is it sort of felt like we were leaving him behind because we had to come back to our house, to our home, but he was still there. We had, we didn't have, you know, the, the things back. We didn't have his remains and things back because we literally had to leave two days later. So it, it there was so much emotion packed into that situation. It was the first it was, I mean, I've lost grandparents, I mean, and, and family members, but there was something different about losing him that was just, I, I don't, I don't think my, I don't think I've ever felt that emotionally sad about anything. And it's, I mean, it's still, it's almost four years since he passed. And for the first time ever, since he passed, I was able to watch a video where I listened to him bark. I can watch videos without problems, but I, I couldn't bring myself to actually turn the sound up. I, I'm not sure why. I don't know why that was so hard. But it was a week ago was the very first time I listened to a video that came up on my Facebook memories that had him barking on it. And we've lost another dog since then. And it was, it was also sad. It, I mean, losing Copper last year was also very, it was very sad. But there was something about the that first dog and the aftermath of it it was just so it's still sad i mean it's it's four years later and people who don't have pets don't understand how painful it is to watch to to have to make that decision and to watch your pet suffer and then pass away and so i i feel like the answer is cliche because I know a lot of people lost pets, but it was a very, it was very difficult. It's just, it was just so, it was such a sad moment in my life. Pets become part of your family. You're responsible for them. You got to make sure it's kind of like raising a kid in, in a way, like a fuzzy kid. Yep. And and I I can fully understand the whole thing with the. Uh, the not being able to listen to the video and everything like that. It's, I have weird things like sometimes, you know, my mom passed away uh, four years ago 
and uh, it's like sometimes I can look at pictures of her. Like my dad has like, which it's really really sad, but my dad like has a shrine basically the house. You know, uh, there's pictures of her everywhere and everything. And some days I have to just like basically put blinders on and just walk straight through and not look at anything. You know, and then sometimes I can just kind of, you know, I'll look over and I'll accept it and everything like that. And it's just like, uh, it's like a weird thing I can't explain, you know, and I don't know why one day is different than the other. You know, I, I guess it's just the, the chemicals inside my body. Some days they can handle a little bit more sadness and some days it's like we can't do this today. So uh, I, I can fully understand that. And that that's the thing you loved him so much that that's what causes all this you know that's just love that you don't get to share on him anymore no and we don't have kids we're that ship has sailed we're not having kids um so our our fur babies are our kids so they're spoiled rotten and i'm proud of it they deserve to be spoiled every single one of them um deserves to be spoiled but we the thing that we've consciously done and it's not been easy but we've consciously we consciously talk about it we talk about dolby and we talk about copper we talk about the fun things they did or something that other dogs will do that will remind us of one of them and we'll we'll talk about how cute that is or how funny that is or ooh, dolby's haunting us because he told he told Leo to do that, you know, kind of thing. And we always joked around that Dolby could haunt it. Come on, just haunt us, buddy. You can do it. Um, so we've tried to keep that that connection, so to speak, in our lives by talking about him and talking about funny things. Um, also, something I really treasure is um, I do. I sometimes do guided paintings at a local painting studio and she did a dog painting and so i took a picture of dolby when he was a puppy with me and i actually did a painting of him and now we keep it in our bedroom and literally if we want to we can look over and say good night to him and it's been very it's a it's a very special a very special thing so again we've it's nice. I said to, I think I said to my husband sometime last year, I said, you know, it's really nice to now be, we're, we're past a lot of the constant sadness that we're able to laugh about the things he did. And that helps me keep him in my heart in a lot of ways. Not that he'll ever leave, but that helps me remember those good things and not just the end of his life so that was a that was that was a lot harder than i thought it was going to be too i think that's the other reason why i feel like that was the saddest moment is it was a lot harder than i expected when i first got a dog it's almost one of those things that if you knew the ending you, you question your beginning. Um, but in the end, all those memories are worth it. It's hard, but what you take with you is is very rewarding and worth it. And we've adopted all of our dogs. That's a big, I will never get my dogs any other way. It will always be through adoption. So knowing that the dogs I have now would be in horrible situations if we hadn't adopted them. Um, maybe even not alive in some instances. So it, it's also very rewarding to to save a, an animal that way and spoil them for as long as you have we have them. And that's what we go. That's what we do. So we have a you know we have a. A little memorial, so to speak. We have a shelving unit that we have pictures and we have the the ashes and we have um, pretty little sayings that 
people have gotten us um, to help keep them around. So you just have to love people while you have to love your family and your loved ones while you can. That's leading us into the last question, which is if you had one word of advice based on your life experience so far, what would it be? I can't, I can't, I can't give you just one. I'm sorry. I'm Southern. I like to talk. I have to give you two. I'll take two. The first one is be ready for change. It's coming. Change will happen. You can't plan for everything. There's always going to be something that's going to change from small things to big things. And the way that we have power over that is to, to adapt, is to accept that the change happens and figure out how to adapt. Not every change is good, not every change is bad, but it's there. Some people, I, I'm the type of person that thrives on it because I've chosen to accept that it will happen. It's just a matter of what is the change because it's coming down the pike. Um, so I always say, be willing to accept the change or have coping strategies to deal with the change if it's not something that you're, is easy or comfortable. The other thing, I've been saying this a lot over the past few years, is just just be kind. Be kind to other people. There is so much going on in this world, so many things that we don't understand that you don't know what somebody's going through when they walk down the street beside you or or past you. Maybe they bump into you and they don't say that they're that they're sorry. But maybe they didn't say they're sorry because they're on the way to the hospital to say goodbye to somebody in their life and and they're laser focused on getting there. Maybe that person who was short with you when you we're in line at Starbucks and you get up to the front and the, the, the worker's not super polite. Maybe they just found out that they're losing their job, that that store is closing. You, you just, you never know what someone else has going on in their lives. And kindness is, is, is huge. It's, it's, it's a minimum that we can do for each other to me it's the bare minimum of what we can do is to be kind you know there's so much as you know there's so much going on in this world from people people protesting people just for being who they are and it kindness would just go so far and if everybody just practiced kindness, and I'll throw in a bonus, mind your own business. <laughs> think that, I say that, I, you have no idea how much I say. People just need to be nice and mind their own business. And this would be a completely different country. <laughs> More people would just, if you don't want to do something, don't do it. It's that simple. And that doesn't mean that you have to make it where other people can't do it. Exactly. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it. But that doesn't mean you have to make it where everybody can't do it. Mind your business. That's what that comes down to to me. But kindness is lacking in in our society. And I mean, I could I, I could give you I, I think so if it comes to social media. We don't have as much face-to-face -face contact with each other, so it's easy to be mean when you're behind a keyboard or behind a phone. Um, but there's just not enough people who will just be kind when people are... Because, like I said, you never know what somebody's going through. You don't... You have no idea what's happening behind somebody's closed doors what's going on in their life and it just takes it it takes so little energy to be kind to somebody it actually takes more effort and energy to be mean 
your heart rate rises, your blood pressure rises. Kindness is just, it releases endorphins. It's just a good thing. It's funny because I meant to say it in the beginning, like when I was kind of introducing you. Have you ever seen the movie Inside Out where they have like the little people that represent like emotions and their sadness and everything like that? Like you are literally the person that I've always just thought is kindness. Like uh, throughout the whole time I've known you, you're one of the most kind people. And I, I mean the word, like I say kind, like specifically, because you're one of the kindest people I've ever known. Thank you. And it's like, and it never changed through all of the time that I've known you and you being gone and everything. And you just always have a kind word to say or you approach things with a kind attitude. And it's like, honestly, one of the most, it's one of the things I most appreciate about you. It's just, I don't know, it's just something that I've always done. I, I, before I even knew I was doing it. Like I've always been, I've always been that person that says, "Oh, just you can cut in front of me in line, you know, or you can. Oh, do you need? Do you want this cookie? I, I don't need this cookie. You want it? <laughs> you know, that's just always been the way I am. Is I guess I guess my love language is acts of service. <laughs> if you put it that way, like I just I really. I really thrive on on that, on on treating people with kindness and respect. You're you're also a very respectful person and everything. Always have been, you know. I can never think of a time where, like, even sometimes when you are like down, you're trying to be kind and bring other people up. Like, I've seen it so many times. It's just imbued to you. That's that's how I view you. You are kindness. And so I'm like, we need some more Ashley in the world. If that's, if that's my legacy, I will gladly take it. My tombstone can say, if, if it says that, that's, that's the impression I, I hope to leave on the world. And I will say you've you've actually evolved strictly from being the kindest person because, you know, you're also a very positive person. Like you uh, on Instagram, on uh, Ashley's feed, she does a lot of daily gratitudes. Like she has a daily gratitude. And I have seen every daily gratitude for years now. And, you know, it actually, it's it's funny because, like, you, you read them and everything, and then it does become a part of the things. Like, I found myself being like, well, today was good because of this, you know, I'm happy for this today. And sometimes it's like like that one defining moment. And sometimes you got to look for a defining good thing in a day. Sometimes, sometimes you're great. Sometimes my gratitude is that I have a house. I have a nice place to live or I have a warm place to live or I was able to eat what I wanted to eat. I had food. I mean, that in and of itself sometimes is enough. So it's, it's about finding every day there is something. And I started doing this. I'm coming up on three years. It was July. It was January 29th, 2020 was the first day I started posting them. And I have missed, I have missed days twice. Once I, I created it and forgot to post it until the next morning. Um, but earlier this year after Copper passed away, I had a hard time for a few days, um, and I just kind of recluse. I, I I wasn't really on social media for a few days. So what I did then was I did four at once. So I have created one for every day for almost three years now, and it is literally part of my daily routine. It's part of my daily routine now. Well, it's past. I, I'm an hour late now for my normal time doing. I have a reminder. But I it it doesn't feel like the day's complete if I haven't 
put down whatever it is that day, whatever I was grateful for that day. If I haven't put it down, it doesn't feel like the day is over until I've actually done it and posted it to social media. And there was a time that for a while I didn't post them. I I got in my own head and I thought people didn't care. Nobody's looking at it. Who cares what my grateful is? And I'm like, but it's not for them. <laughs> it's not it's not from anybody else. <laughs> it's for me. So I went back to posting it every day after I got out of my head and said no, this is this is for you. Do it for yourself, not for other people. And as a fan of your daily positivity, I say I'm glad you got out of your head for it because it's part of my daily routine. It always comes up on my feed and I always it literally makes me think, you know, hey, stay positive today. You know, it's it's weird because it's just it's a small thing. But you do pass that positivity to me. And if I can pass that positivity to somebody else, we start the chain. So everyone practice kindness. Well, I absolutely enjoyed this today. And it was really good getting to catch up with you. I haven't got to like just talk with you like this in a long time. I mean, we've done some texting here and there, but not like a full conversation. Yeah, I hadn't, you know, I I got to to learn things that I I had not known and everything and got to to share you with the world. So that was an awesome thing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you again, Ashley, or as I should say, kindness. <gasps> thank you. I want to thank you all for listening today. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe and leave a five-star review. Also check out the video podcast at Handlebar ASMR on YouTube for extras.